All right, good morning. Sorry we're running a little bit late of our own people. If you're listening by way of Facebook Live, uh, we didn't realize that we were going to have some music. We had Co Cody come and play the piano, and we've been singing some hymns and having some prayer and talking about a few things before the message. So hopefully you stayed with us, and uh, hey, we're all out of our element, right? <laughs> We didn't decide to uh, record the music part, so we did start at 1045, but we had some music, so we're going to get into the message right now, but let me just welcome all of you that are listening by way of uh, our Facebook Live page. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, Isaiah chapter 21, Isaiah chapter 21, and I'm going to do the best I can to move where I can get a little bit of light here. We're trying to get the best recording we can here, so just bear with us. Uh, this is this is different for all of us. We have a small group here, and we had a group with us for Sunday school, and we'll send you that file here uh, sometime today as we taught through uh, the, the Gospel of John for like we do in our adult class. Uh, but we are in the book of Isaiah. As you can imagine, with all that we are facing right now, and it just seems like it all kind of came on us out of nowhere, um, I am uh, confident that most pastors that are preaching by way of live stream today are going to be speaking on this subject uh, relating to this crisis. So I want to speak to you this morning about the Christian and crisis, the Christian and crisis. And we're going to read the first 10 verses of Isaiah chapter 21, Isaiah chapter 21. Hope everybody has a Bible. If you're listening at home, have your Bibles out. We're going to read the first 10 verses, okay? Okay. It says in Isaiah 21, beginning in verse 1, The burden of the desert of the sea, as whirlwinds in the south pass through, so it cometh from the desert, from a terrible land. A grievous vision is declared unto me, the treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam, besiege, O Medida, all the sighing thereof have I made to cease. Therefore are my loins filled with pain, pangs have taken hold upon me, as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it, I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted, fearfulness affrighted me, the night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. Prepare the table, watch in the watchtower, eat, drink, arise ye princes and anoint the shield. For thus hath the Lord said unto me, Go, set a watchman, let him declare what he seeth. And he saw a chariot with a couple of horsemen, a chariot of asses and a chariot of camels, and he hearkened diligently with much heed. And he cried, O lion, my Lord, I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my ward whole nights. And behold, here cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen, and he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the graven images of her gods he hath broken unto the ground. O oh, my threshing and the corn of my floor, that which I have heard of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have I declared unto you. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, God and Creator, our Lord, our Sustainer, the one that we know loves us, Lord, we're coming before you, asking God that you would help us and strengthen us through this crisis that we are facing in our country and around the world. Lord, we're all in a situation none of us has ever been in. And Lord, we don't know the future, but we know you hold the future. And so we're going to trust you today, Lord. Thank you for the time that we had earlier to teach in your word and be able to have the technology available to send that to our folks and other people who might be interested in hearing it. Now for this Facebook recording, it will go up on our, uh, not only our Facebook page, but our YouTube channel. We just pray, God, that these uh, times that we can spend with just a small group like this here in my own home, God, would be pleasing to you. And Lord, as we think about this crisis, Lord, our hearts are anxious and there's many unanswered questions, such uncertainty that all of us face. But Lord, we as Christians have a hope the world doesn't have. And so Lord, I pray that we'll have greater faith. I pray, Lord, that just like the apostles asked for, that we would ask to increase our faith, Lord, through this all. Bless this message now we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Do you know, 
God's people are not strangers to crisis. What I mean by crisis? Crisis are times of personal or national panic, stress, anxiety, emergency. Think of how many times God's people have been involved in crisis over the years. Think of the scriptures, for instance. All through scripture we have crisis. I can mention so many of them. The flood. <laughs> Think about what a crisis that was. When Moses was told, or Noah was told that God's going to send a flood and he preached to the people of his day. And of course, they didn't listen. How about the plagues in Moses' time? Those were the crisis. Imagine the things that he did that affected all of Egypt and, and his own people had to listen to, uh, at times to do certain things. I think about the crisis. Wow. In the, in the book of Esther, this wicked man Haman uh, who wanted to destroy all the Jewish people, Right? What a crisis. It wasn't for Esther intervening, of course, by God's providence behind all of that, uh, that this, the Jewish people were saved. Well, we go to the New Testament. We see crisis right from the very beginning. Here this wicked man, Herod, who's, the, who's on the throne, put there by the Romans. He hears about a Messiah being born. And so he, he orders the death of all the little children in a radius around Bethlehem. What a, what a crisis. Uh, I think of how uh, the early church, the apostles were in such crisis by the persecution they immediately faced. Well, here we go into the book of Acts, and it looks like the church is going well. All of a sudden, Herod uh, has James beheaded. He arrests Peter. He's going to kill him too if it wasn't for God letting him go free. Uh, the apostles begin to die. Stephen is stoned. I mean, you talk about crisis. Christianity is no stranger to crisis. Think about a crisis, part of the greatest crisis. It is, for sure, the greatest crisis of all. Jesus dying on the cross. That was a crisis for his people. Remember how he met the night before and he said to the apostles, hey, uh, and I'm paraphrasing as you can imagine, but he, he just basically says, hey, uh, you're, you're, you're going to be full with sorrow. You're, you're going to be shocked. You're, you're going to be heartbroken because you won't understand why I'm going to do what I'm going to have to do. And that was a crisis, but of course it, it changed to, to joy and, and glory after that. Well, we're definitely in a crisis now. This COVID-19 is a crisis, right? And, and whether or not we agree with all the newscast and all the commentators and all the experts, that, that's really irrelevant to the fact that we have to live and, and, and reach our society wherever it's at. And right now it's in crisis, okay? And so we have to face it. I chose Isaiah 21 just for our text. We're not going to stay in Isaiah 21, but it, it was to me a, a tremendous little chapter, beginning of a chapter, because if you read it and followed, hopefully at home you're doing that, um, you saw uh, all these words of crisis. It's actually about Babylon, the fall of the Babylonian Empire. Now, it wouldn't happen for some time, but Isaiah is a prophet, and he's writing about a future event like prophets uh, did. And so, if you, as we read through and you saw this, he's talking about how everything's in turmoil. Everything's just turned upside down. It looked like Babylon was this great uh, kingdom and it was going to uh, you know, take over the world and, and Nebuchadnezzar was full of pride and it looked like everything. But before long, God toppled the whole thing. Well, I really wanted instead to dwell uh, not just on the fact of crisis happening. But we all know crisis happens. Uh, there's many crises that have happened over history as I talked about. Uh, but I want to talk about uh, how we are to face crisis. And I think the best way to do that is give you an example of one how God's people faced it. So go back with me to the historical book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19. These two chapters, we're going to read a little bit out, out of both of them. And it's a wonderful story because this is really a crisis. And I think we're going to learn by King Hezekiah, who was the king of Judah how he and his people dealt with this crisis. And I believe we're going to learn some great lessons how you and I can face this crisis that we're a part of. Now let me set a little bit of background before I jump right into some verses out of chapter 18 and onward. Um, remember, at this time there was a world empire, a world kingdom called Assyria. The Assyrians were the world empire. They were the dominant uh, empire of the time. And they had been uh, uh, imperialistically moving out from their headquarters in Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian uh, Empire. And they were taking over nation after nation. Well, eventually they got to Israel. 
And by the time we read the text in chapter 18, they've already attacked and came from the north and came down south through northern Israel first. Remember when the kingdom split after the death of Solomon? You had northern Israel, the ten tribes in the north. You have Judah in the south. And so they've already taken northern Israel. And they've fallen to the Assyrians. But now uh, their king, uh, Sennacherib, and, and uh, well, actually, Shalmaneser at this point, Sennacherib would be later, uh, and their general, they're not satisfied with just that. Now the real prize is Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the major city, was the capital. Of course, the beautiful temple was still uh, standing there, and they wanted to invade to capture it. Now here's Hezekiah. He's the king of Judah. And he gets news kind of out of nowhere. It was much similar to the crisis we have just been thrown on and just been thrown in, if you will. And he hears that northern Israel has toppled and Samaria, their capital, has just given up. And, uh, and a lot of the Assyrians, they just, they just uh, surrendered easily. And he sees them coming his way. And now we're going to enter the story. And I want you to see some things about crisis that, that I think will help us to face this Terrible situation we're in with so many unanswered questions. I want you to see, first of all, the crisis comes. The crisis comes. Look at 2 Kings 18. If you're following in your Bibles, I hope you'll read these verses with me. 2 Kings, it is actually Sennacherib by this time. I was right. Look, look at verse 13. 2 Kings 18, 13. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them? Now, not only is this crisis because he's already successfully taken over northern Israel and all its land, now he's already been successful at capturing all the smaller towns and villages on his way going south to where Judah is. So part of Judah, as a Judah was like, we call it a state. We might just refer to it as a state, Jerusalem the capital. They've already begun to fall. It looks bad. And now he's coming his way, he's making his way to uh, this city of Jerusalem. I have to believe that Hezekiah was shocked at the, at the swiftness of, the, of the, uh, how quickly and unforeseen this crisis came to him. I mean, this huge army of Assyria was way north in their empire for a long time and they didn't have to worry about them. But all of a sudden, now they're coming down and they're on the move. It reminds me of just how quick this, this COVID-19 crisis has come. I mean, let's face it. No more than about a week ago, a little more than a week ago, uh, definitely a couple of weeks ago. It was only just news that was happening in, in China and it was happening. Maybe it spread a little bit. But I mean, this thing just kind of snowballed to where the crisis just came on us out of nowhere. It was unforeseen. It was unexpected. We were unprepared. That's how crises are. I mean, it wouldn't be a crisis if you were prepared for it, right? <laughs> That's what a crisis is defined as. And so Sennacherib comes and Hezekiah is not ready. Well, let's move on. Now we're going to see the crisis compromised. The crisis is going to be compromised. Here it came, but now the first attempt at Hezekiah is going to try to compromise to end the crisis. Look at verse 14. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying that's, that he was dwelling in a city, Lachish, that they had already taken. That's just above Jerusalem. He's going to try to uh, appease him, appease Sennacherib and the Assyrian army. I have offended, he says, return from me. That which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. Now, that's a lot of money. Here's what's happening. Here's Hezekiah. He, he succumbs. He, 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 uh, he says, listen, I'm sorry I offended you. Uh, what can we do to keep you from attacking? That's what he's compromising. And so Sennacherib first tells him, okay, you send us this much money. It was a lot of money, by the way. A talent is 120 pounds. Okay? That's a talent. He sends 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold, pure silver and gold, to appease him. And Hezekiah, notice that wasn't enough. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. He goes into the temple, starts taking the silver out of there. He goes to his own palace, anything he can find. He's desperate to avoid this, this invasion. Verse 16, at that time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the, of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah king of Judah had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. He had done some remodeling himself just a few uh, earlier times where he had put gold to overlay some of the pillars on the outside of the temple. This is that beautiful temple 
originally built by Solomon, but every king kind of did some remodeling additions to it. Now he's, he's getting the gold off it. He's melting the gold off of it, making gold bricks or whatever he has to do. He's doing all this to compromise, to try to stop this crisis from happening. Now, let's look at our crisis. How is our crisis being compromised? Well, many, many ways. I'll give you just a couple. First of all, by people who don't see God in it all. They're going to compromise it. They're not going to understand it. They're going to, they're going to try to appease it, change it, alter it, whatever, because they don't see what God can do and, and is doing. They don't believe in the power of God to either bring or to, to allow something to happen. They're going to put all their hope in man-made reasons for this crisis and man-made solutions to it, right? That's a compromise. That is not the way to face directly what's happening. And here, he's going to learn his lesson, Hezekiah, in a moment. You'll see what happens. But his first inclination, well, let's just avoid this thing. Let's just give him money and pay him off and bribe him. Maybe he won't bother us. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. There's all kinds of wrong responses we're seeing from this crisis. Think, think of just a couple of things that I've noticed. You've seen this on the news. We're all glued to our newscast and whatever on the Internet, however you get your news. Think of the selfishness at the stores when this thing first, first happened. I was telling my wife after we went to the store last Monday, I mean, I had never seen shelves that bare. In, my, in all, all my life, I'm 56 years old. I've been going to stores since I was a kid. I've never went in a store and saw that few things on the shelves. I thought I was in Russia or some communist country where they don't have anything to give the people. Uh, and you know why that was? And I told my wife, I said, I, don't know, I wonder why these stores didn't put a limit on everything. They should have. I think some of them started doing that after. But you know what it was? Here's the wrong response. Hey, who cares about everybody else? I'm getting all the toilet paper, all the hand sanitizer, all the whatever, the meat, the bread, whatever, a bottle of water that I can. You know, it's a compromise. They're saying, who cares about everybody else as long as I save my hide? That's really what they're saying. Think about the, the, the people who don't even care about this. We were watching the news yesterday, and you heard about the, these young people, these college students going down to Florida and still on spring break, going out to the beaches. They had to run them off finally because they didn't have enough sense to leave. They still wanted to congregate and do all their drinking and all their wicked things together. I couldn't believe these, these young people didn't have enough sense to know that they could be carrying that disease or spread it or get it when they're down there. They don't care. Who cares? Let's live it up. Eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. <laughs> that was their motto down there, I think. Think about the greed. Do you hear about how, and I don't know if it's happening around here. I hope it's not, but how there's been price gouging. They were, they were raising the price of hand sanitizer to $10 a bottle in certain places. Well, they, they've stopped it. They've arrested some of the people who are doing it. That's what you get out of these things. Greed, and how about the politics of it? Oh, the politics are just, I cannot believe that the people who hate our president, okay, and I'm not saying I agree with 100% of what Mr. Trump does or says, but I think he's handled this crisis as best he could and he's done a pretty good job. But look at the liberals that hate him. What are they trying to do? They've made a political issue out of this. Oh, he's, he's the cause of the whole COVID-19 thing. We wouldn't even have a case of it here in the States. And now he's calling it the Chinese virus and they don't like that. Friends, it's, it's just unbelievable how they try to compromise. You're not going to end a crisis by compromising. So let's look at the next point in the text here. The crisis continued. It's going to continue in verse 17. Remember, he pays them off, thinks, it's, oh, it's, it's okay, he won't come and hurt us. Look at verse 17. And the king of Assyria sent Tardin and Rabsaris and Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. Did his compromise work? It didn't work at all. He paid them all that silver, all that gold. Oh, we're in the clear, guys. I bet he went and told some of the, some of the people in Jerusalem that were then all of them. They were running out of those cities that had been already invaded. They were all in Jerusalem now within the walls thinking they'd be protected. They're asking their king to help them. I bet he, he probably sent out a memo. Maybe the people on the wall would say, hey, we're good. We're, no, nothing to worry about. We've paid off Assyria. The King Sennacherib should be fine with us. We give them all we can. It wasn't any time he still sends his army to invade the city anyway. See, every time you compromise to solve a crisis and not deal with it directly, it continues. 
It continues. I mean, if you don't deal with crisis in the right way and you think you can either be in denial of them that they're not really a crisis or, or you know, we don't really need to take serious measures to stop it. Hey, it's been proven and, and I'm, I'm not racist in any way. And I hope you understand that and you would believe me when I say that. But when we found out that this crisis started in Wuhan in China and was not contained to that city, really what happened was that it's continued because they did compromise with it. Uh, the country that has the most cases of COVID-19 right now, as you know, is Italy. Italy is the epicenter, really, in the world. Now, we, our epicenter is in New York, we know, but the, the worst cases anywhere in the world right now is Italy. And did you, did you hear the news about what they were doing for the first couple of weeks when that thing broke out? They still had public transit going till just about a week ago. They were letting people still do things. What were they thinking? I'm not, I'm not saying that I don't feel sympathy for the people in Italy, and they've had the largest amount of deaths from it too, but here's what I'm saying. You can't treat crisis like it's not really happening. You can't just say, well, if we just throw some money at it, like Hezekiah was saying to this crisis, hey, if we just give that guy some money, give him some silver and gold, he'll leave us alone. No, it still came to his doors. And, and if we don't hit this and deal with it in the right manner, we're going to talk about how that is supposed to be dealt with in a little while, but you can't compromise with crisis. Let's go on to the next point. So we've seen the crisis, it came, it was compromised, it continued anyway. Now I want you to see the crisis as it's communicated. Let's jump on to chapter 19. We don't have time to deal with every bit of this text. I'm giving you the highlights and there's a lot you can fill in if you read it, but you, you're, I'm going to give you the highlights. I want to see how this crisis is communicated in chapter 19. And this is so important, how to, deal, how to deal with the crisis. And it came to pass, verse 1, when King Hezekiah heard it, well, he hears about the invading armies, and now they've surrounded the city of Jerusalem. The same guy he tried to pay off, didn't work, he gets his armies all around the city of Jerusalem. They're, they're in a siege. He hears it. He decides, I, I better do something. Look what he does. That he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. Oh, this is a great turnaround in this whole crisis. I mean, you're going to start to see how this thing's going to end eventually because of this beginning of verse 9, at chapter 19. Here is Hezekiah says, I don't know what to do. You tore your clothes and put sackcloth on. It was a picture of, of woe and sorrow and repentance and, and I'm desperate and whatever. And notice then what he does to communicate this crisis. He sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, these are guys who worked in the temple, and the elders of the priest, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. Same Isaiah, we read his text in chapter 21 a little while ago. He was on the scene. He's a, he's a prophet at that time. He did the right thing. He says, now I want you two guys to go get I Isaiah. I want you to find him for me, and I want you to tell him what's going on. He needs to intercede for us. I don't know what to do. I need his help. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah. Here's what they're going to say to Isaiah, these two men who go for Hezekiah. This is a day of, uh, this day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth and there is not strength to bring forth. It's a, these are old euphemisms, kind of synonyms of great woman in travail. Her baby won't come out. It's breach or whatever. It's terrible. What are we going to do? He says, it may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh. Now, Rabshakeh was the general in charge of attacking and conquering the city for his king, Sennacherib. So he's going to be kind of the main spokesman here. And he's the one been intimidating the people. When they would siege a city, I should have said this, when they would, would siege a city, that means nobody gets in, nobody gets out. What they would do is intimidate the people. They didn't want to even have to fight against the city and lose some of their own men potentially in a combat thing. They would just starve them out. And so he says, he, he hears Rabshikah with all his uh, intimidation and so on. He says, may, it may be that God will hear what he said. He does hear, but that's a prayer. Whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to reproach the living God and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. Now, this is the, the communication part. It, it's such a key to any crisis. Getting the right information out. Getting an honest, realistic 
uh, a sense of what's happening. You know what the biggest problem with this crisis is right now? You know this. Is we don't know who to believe and what's really happening half the time. Or how to deal with it. Or what's happening there. What are we supposed to do? Here? Lack of proper communication in any crisis. It's a, it's a horrible thing that the, the, the people here in, in Judah and Jerusalem were facing this crisis, but at least Hezekiah, he's taking the right steps. He's communicating to God's man Isaiah. He's getting the right people involved. Now, you've probably watched, uh, I'm sure, if you haven't watched all of it, you watched some of President uh, Trump's daily uh, briefings on the, on the crisis. And the only thing you have to respect and like about what he's doing is he's getting qualified people to represent different fields of this, of trying to, to uh, conquer this crisis, trying to deal with it. People who know what they're doing. He, he's delegating. That's what you do. And in a sense, that's what Hezekiah was doing. Hezekiah is saying, go tell Isaiah what's going on. I don't know if I can get a hold of God. Maybe He's God's prophet. You know, tell him. Tell him what's happening. Maybe he could pray for us and he can intervene. Hey, you know, President Trump doesn't have all the answers. He, he knows that. I mean, he's trying to put a positive face on the whole thing. And, and that's good because you, can, you don't want to panic. Panic doesn't help anything. When people start panicking, you're not, going to get a, uh, you're not going to end a crisis that way. It's going to get worse. Do you ever notice, it's very interesting how the fire department and firemen work. Um, they'll come up to a house or a building that's on fire. I've seen this. You've seen movies and maybe seen it live. Um, they are not in a big hurry, it looks like. You ever see how, but they're methodical. And, and they've been taught that if, if they get in a panic and they start doing things like this, you know, really herky-jerky and, and just kind of uh, a free-for-all, they'll, they'll mess up. When you start doing things impulsively and, and you don't um, take your time and, and focus what you're doing and make sure you do it right, so you'll think of people are dying up in this building or in this house. Here's the fireman. They, I mean, I'm not going slow, but they're not in a panic. And that's a great lesson. Sometimes we, I'm telling you, when you start getting panicked and you start doing things too impulsively and, and say you're late, you ever, you're running late, you've got to be somewhere. Does it help you to, to try to, to go faster? No, because you'll mess up. You'll drop something, you'll forget something, you'll walk out the door and don't have something you need. I've done it a hundred times. If there's anybody been in a hurry in their life, my wife will tell you, don't put the camera on her. Uh, the, my wife will tell you that I'm, I'm always in a hurry, it seems. But I'm telling you, the more I hurry, the worse things get. And so we can't, you know, what's the main question everybody's been asking about this crisis? How long? How long? It's almost ridiculous. I, I, I can't believe these are professional reporters that are paid to, to report the news and they get in this, this conference and this, this update with the president. Every day they ask the same thing. He tells you the same thing. Nobody knows how long. But see, you know what it is? It's the panic. Panic wonders how long I have to be in the situation. Hey, I've asked how long in my mind. I've thought the thing through like you have, I'm sure. Hey, we all want to know how long, but hey, a crisis doesn't give you all the answers. And so that leads me to my next point. Not only did he communicate, but I want you to see the crisis complicated. This is a big wrench in what was happening here. I'll begin in verse 10. Let me show you how this thing gets complicated. Thus shall ye speak. Now, this is Rabshakeh. I'm not reading all the verses, but I'm jumping in. Now, Rabshakeh is, he's a politician. He's a general. He, he's trying to intimidate Hezekiah to give up. Just open the doors or open the gates and let us in and give up. Just like Samaria did and we'll be fine. There won't be any crisis. You'll just be our slaves. <laughs> That's really, really what he wanted. So he's going to tell Hezekiah a message. Thus shall ye speak to Hezekiah, the king of Judah, saying... Let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hands, hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? Now here's what he's saying. Hey, you heard that these other lands have fallen who had all their gods. Don't believe in your God. He's no different. This is a pagan saying that. He doesn't believe in Yahweh God, the Jehovah God of Israel. He says, don't. Listen to your God and don't believe in him as a guy. He's not going to help you. Did all the other gods of these other nations we conquered recently, did they help them? Have the gods of the nations, here it is, delivered them, verse 12, which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran and, and Reseph, and the children of Eden, which were in uh, Thelazar. Where is the king of Hamath? 
and the king of Arpad, and the king of the city of Sepharvaim, of Hena and Iva. And Hezekiah received the letter. This was actually in a letter form to him. And Hezekiah received the letter of the, of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Now, here's the complication of this. He just heard that, uh, or he just sent his men, I should put it that way. He just sent his men to Isaiah. He probably had some hope after doing that, I would think. Isaiah is the main prophet in Judah, and he thinks, hey, I, get, I, pro- I got Isaiah on my side. I know he'll pray. I know he'll get God's, God's hand in this. He'll get atten- God's attention. And he probably thought, maybe, maybe this crisis will be averted. But all of a sudden, he gets his letter from Rabshakeh. And I'll tell you, that letter just broke his heart. He, here he had some glimpse of hope. Maybe this crisis was going to end. Maybe they would just walk away and think, well, I can't do it. I don't know what he was thinking. But all of a sudden, this thing is complicated because he gets this letter and says, you better not even believe in your God, Hezekiah. We're still going to conquer you. He's not going to say, you better give up like everybody else gave up, all these other nations. Well, see, this is the complication of a crisis. Hey, the word crisis literally means uh, that it's complicated. We don't have all the answers. That's what makes it a crisis. Everybody wants answers in a crisis, and we just don't have them. I mean, that is the hardest thing about a crisis, panic. Do you know there's more panic right now over the uncertainty of what's going to happen in the future, whether it's next week, next month, five months, whatever, than really of the actual consequences of getting COVID-19. Let's face it, they've said this time and time again. 80% of the people that, that uh, are infected with COVID-19 end up beating it. So I'm not, I'm not minimizing the, the 20, but remember, even out of the 20% we've been hearing, you guys heard all these news, Cass, even out of the 20%, only about 1% to 2% out of the 20 that have to be hospitalized, have to have care and, and, and some medical attention, they beat it. So we're talking about 2% of people that get it are going to die from it. Now, I'm not minimizing the, the 2%. What I'm saying is the... The complications of the uncertainty is what really has caused the crisis. It's we're all panicking because, uh, and again, what it's done to the economy. Of course, we all are concerned about that. I mean, I think of these hourly people who these like all these restaurant employees at waiting tables and washing dishes, and cooking food for all the people coming. That I mean, basically, most of them are out of work. All they have now is you know takeout and and. And to go and these delivery apps and so forth. I mean, of course we're concerned, but it's the uncertainty and, and it's complicated everything. And that's what it did for Hezekiah. Well, let me move on. I want you to see the, the crisis confessed here. The crisis confessed. Now, this is where Hezekiah is really at the end of his rope. He doesn't know what to do. I think he had a little glimmer of hope at first with, with Isaiah getting involved. And he's just, he's done. He didn't know what to do. Remember what it said at the end of verse 14? He gets this letter. He doesn't know what to do. He goes up into the temple. And he lays it out before God. Did you ever do that when, when something happens? Or maybe you, got a, maybe you got a letter from the IRS or a letter from a loved one that's, that's, uh, that's a shock to you. Or you get some news, you just lay it before God. That's all you can do. In verse 15, it says, uh, And Hezekiah prayed. Remember, he laid it before the Lord. Hezekiah received the letter. And he and the messengers went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, that's off the mercy seat, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth, Lord, bow down thine ear, and hear, open, Lord, thine eyes, and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands." wood and stone, therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. Wow. This is the real answer to solving a crisis. We know it. It's sad that most of the world doesn't know it. That is, we've got to get God's intervention. We have to turn to God in desperation. This is a desperate prayer. Hezekiah, I mean, he builds up who God is, but he says, God, 
Open your eyes. About this. It kind of seemed like God wasn't even involved here. He's kind of saying, God, have you seen what's happening here? Do you see this letter I got? I mean, God, what are you going to do? What's going to happen to us? Listen to what they're saying to you, God. Listen to what they're saying about you, God. He's saying, hey, God, if you don't do something, we're finished. We have no hope. Well, guys, I can tell you, and darling, <laughs> there is no hope without God. We're hopeless without God. I mean, man, it, 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 one thing, if anything that this crisis with this COVID-19 disease has told me, has showed, showed me and showed you, I'm sure, a, a respiratory, I heard a guy say, it's a respiratory cold. <laughs> it's basically what it is. That's what it starts out to be. Can you imagine a respiratory cold, a flu, it's basically like the flu bug, has got the whole world in panic. Compare that to what is going to happen after the rapture. And when the Antichrist takes over, and we'll get into that some other message, but and the whole world is is in panic. Do you do you think that if something like COVID nineteen get the world in panic, how much more panic will the world be when there's something like remember the Black Death? Yeah, yeah. You, you want to study something that'll shock you? Go home and Google the bubonic plague of the Black Death of the 1300s in Europe, where half of the population died. Half, not one percent. Not 2%, which is a high number for COVID-19 deaths now. 50% of the entire European continent was decimated. With no vaccines, no care, no, no way to stop it. I mean, that was a crisis of all crises. Even to this very day, people talk about the bubonic plague, the Black Death. But here you have to confess it. You can't act like it, it's not happening. And this total crying out to God is what's going to have to happen. I'm praying that this crisis, and I know God uses everything, and God either brings everything or allows everything, right? We've said that. There's no other choices. He brings it or allows it. And I'm praying that God and His providence will use this, even if He didn't bring it directly as a punishment upon man, I pray He'll use it to wake up our country and our world. And this confession that Hezekiah made and the way he confessed is the only hope. It's going to be the only hope for our country and for our world to get out of this and have something good come from it. That's what you hope. Hey, it's not good to see all these people with it and those that have died. There's thousands worldwide that have died of it. Of course that's not good. But from it, something can be good. And you know what? If, if this does turn out, and we don't, I, I, I'm not a prophet, son of a prophet. I don't know what's going to happen. But I, I tell you, if it does turn out for good and something ends up, if it ends up, you know, going away here in the next couple of weeks, months, whatever, I, I don't know what the time frame is going to be. You know what we ought to do? I love the last statement in verse 19. We better give God the glory. I'm afraid he's not going to get any credit, even if he does intervene in a way that we can see his hand in it. Because Hezekiah says, do all this, God, save us out of the hand of this wicked man that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. Let me go on to the crisis calm. I'm almost done. The crisis calm. Now we're almost at the end. We've, we've got to the top. We're on the other side. This thing gets calm. Verse 20, notice what it says. After he lays out that letter and prays to God, verse 20, then Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, That which thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, I have heard. Verse 32, let's jump down. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. He hears the prayer of Hezekiah. Um, Isaiah's intervened too. Here's what God's going to do. This is the final part of how this thing's calmed and it'll be ended. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city. Hey, his guys were still around, the whole army of Israel. I mean, army of Assyria, pardon me, are around Jerusalem still when God says this. Nor shoot an arrow there, nor come up before it with shield, nor cast a bank again. They're not going to even fire a shot. They're not going to try to knock down the, the walls. By the way that he came, Sennacherib, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. I'll tell you, God is so loving. He is so merciful that when His people, first let's talk about His people, when you and I as Christians, 
When we call out to God, and there's a lot of Christians still in America. We're not the majority by any means, but we're still a good, probably the largest group of Christians in one country is still in America, I believe. Pretty close. And if even just all the Christians in America would cry out to God to deliver our country, deliver our world, don't you think it'd have an impact? I think it will. This is proven by this crisis. As soon as Hezekiah, he's just one man, but he must have got the people behind him too. And it says that in other verses I didn't read, but it says that God said, here, tell Hezekiah what I'm going to do. They're not going to come into the city. They're not going to take the city. And he had earlier predicted, back in verse number five, uh, 7, Behold, here's God saying to Isaiah, Behold, I will send a blast upon him, a blast of judgment, hot wind judgment. And he shall hear a rumor and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. That's an acrobat. So the end of the story, let me end it. The crisis concluded. Verse 35. And it came to pass that night. Here's what God did. He intervened. The crying out of, of God's people, Hezekiah, the prophet Isaiah, and it came to pass that night. Wow, not two weeks later, not a month, not a year later, that night. That the angel of the Lord went out and smote, that's the word means to strike or to strike a blow, smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand. Hundred and eighty five thousand soldiers surrounded that city of Jerusalem. That's a lot of soldiers even in them that time. And when they arose in the, early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. <laughs> I always love that phrase. It doesn't mean the corpses woke up. It means when the people of the city woke up and the watchmen on the walls looked out. They were used to seeing these uh, cruel and, and bloodthirsty Assyrian soldiers waiting for them to get the command to break down the walls, to breach the walls, to attack. All of a sudden they wake up Sunlight, look out. They're all dead corpses laying all over the ground. And notice how it ends. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. He went back to his capital. He said, he knew, <laughs> they all knew that this was only of God that could do this. And it came to pass as he was worshiping. Now he gets back to his, his, his hometown in Nineveh. And he goes, believe me, after all that, you think he would have said, you know what, I better start worshiping that God who did that. Now he goes into a temple to start worshiping his own false gods again. This is what happens to him. And it came to pass as he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his God, that Adramelech and Sherezer, his sons, smote him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia, and Esar had and his son reigned in his stead. Gosh, can you imagine your own two sons kill you? That's how wicked a man this man was, and he wouldn't listen to God. And in this crisis that he caused, Israel's totally delivered and he dies at the hand of his own sons. Well, you notice I didn't name the or title of the message the, the Christian in crisis. I titled it the Christian and crisis because we're not to be in crisis mode. We're never in crisis. We shouldn't be. We're people who believe God. The hopeless world around us, they're in crisis. I talked about the Christian and crisis. Hey, we've got to live in this world, but we're not to be of the world, right? If, if the Christian even dies of this virus, hey, we're probably going to hear, I can't guarantee you out of the thousands worldwide that have died, can we literally say no Christian was among them? No, we couldn't say that. Because you might think, hey, if somebody, what if one of us, I can't guarantee that, every, that each one of us in this room might not get it and could die of it. Can I guarantee that? Can you? Nobody can. But let's say this. If one of us at our church, say one of our church members gets this, has coronavirus, has the COVID-19 virus won? No, it hasn't won. Because if I die of COVID-19, I was going to die anyway at some point, right? And where am I going to go when I die? I'm going to go right to be with the Lord. I'm not going to lose. But think about the lost. When they die, they, th they think they have suffering now with COVID-19 and the symptoms they'll have, and they have nothing but an eternal hell of judgment awaiting them after this. Hey, if God's people die, we're going to go right to be with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time we've had to open your word, God, and this...
Tremendous example in Scripture of a crisis that your people went through. Lord, there's been many, many crises. Your people have, have not been strangers to it. We've went through many over the centuries of time. But Lord, you've always brought us out of them. And Lord, you're going to do that with this COVID-19 crisis, I know. However you see to do it, we're going to give you glory. And I'm praying that even the unsaved world will begin to see that there is no hope in man-made solutions and man-made ideas. And there's some things that you bring or allow to come that you do it on purpose. A man will see how futile, how ignorant, how unable he is to solve his own problems. I'm praying, God, that, that Christians first around the world, in our own country especially, that we would wake up and be revived and stirred and, and be a good witness to people around us. Help us to do good, and by our good works, Lord, people will see you and glorify your name. I pray, Lord, we'll not be those who act like we have no hope. Well, we're not in crisis. We're having to deal with a crisis. I pray you'll help us, Lord, to be the salt and the light we need to be. And, Lord, I pray that unsaved people will be saved through this. I can even imagine an unsaved person gets this disease, thinks they're going to die. Maybe they're panicked that they will get the disease. Lord, may some Christian give them the truth. Realize, hey, if you don't die from this, you'll die from something. Life is short. It's brief. I pray we can be a good witness through it. Please, Lord, protect our church through this time. Oh, it's different, Lord. It's it's unusual. We're all out of our comfort zones. And, Lord, I pray for our people. Many of I hope, are, are viewing this now from Facebook. I pray your hand to be upon them. I pray, Lord, that this, this uh, crisis will not last long. I pray that however you see fit to give wisdom and and, uh, intervention, uh, that God, it can be averted. And Lord, that those who have it can be healed from it. And even those who have lost their lives, you'd comfort and bring truth to the families, that they'll see that life is short and their loved one, whether they went to heaven or not, they can still go to heaven if they'll turn to you. So God, give us wisdom. Thank you for your word, your Holy Spirit, and his precious comfort. Have your hand upon our church, our nation, our world. We love you, we praise you, we commit all this into your hands. In Jesus' name.